Welcome to the Burns Podcast, talking all things model aviation with expert guests and enthusiasts in the field of aeronautics. And now, here's your host, Nick Burns. Welcome, folks, to the Burns Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing retired General Jeff Cashman. Before retiring from the military, General Cashman had a distinguished career in the Air Force and Air National Guard for 32 years. He now finds himself flying wide-body planes internationally for a major airline. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks, Nick. Good to be here. <laughs> Good afternoon. How are you doing today? I am fantastic. Well, that's great to hear. Um, I have a lot of questions for you today and a lot of talking to do. So to get right into it, I understand that you know, you've know you served in the Air Force and now fly international flights. Um, and so can you provide our listeners, uh, besides our you know introduction biography into you, really a little history on how you became a pilot? Yeah, I sure can. Um, when I was about your age, I loved the idea of being a military pilot. That's what really captured my imagination. So I went to college at the Air Force Academy, went to Air Force fl- uh, flight school, mm-hmm. and flew for 10 years with the Air Force. After that, I uh, made a mid-career transition from the active component Air Force to the Air National Guard. And when I was hired by the Air National Guard, it was uh, with an eye towards becoming a drill status guardsman, a part-time guardsman. And my companion job, my civilian job, was an airline pilot with a major airline. So that's where I made the jump from one to the other. Right. And uh, when you first started obviously before college did you play simulator games or you know online games with planes or how did you find this you know uh very little of that existed back in 1985 when i graduated i i think there was some version of flight simulator out there but um it, it wasn't on my radar no i flew light aircraft a little bit when i was in high school uh-huh. just to make sure that um you know, I love the idea of flying, but I, I've seen people that throw up all over themselves every time they they could do it. So um, right. in practice, I wanted to make sure I liked it as well. So I, I did a little bit of that uh, myself before I graduated from high school, but th- that was really the only outlet I had for this. Um, there was a uh, RC club in my community. I know now. Uh, I didn't know at the time, and it, yeah. was, it wasn't on my radar either then. And so, were your parents related mil- uh, in the military? My dad all? served in the army. Oh, yes, okay. and that's you know that's the biggest predictor of somebody inclined towards military service right. is a close relationship with somebody else who has been in the military. You understand the lifestyle. <laughs> you understand the mentality of it. Why people do uh-huh. it, uh, and um, even today, that's what is the on ramp for people uh, joining the military is uh, being close with somebody who has done it themselves. Well, that's great. And so now when you obviously got into the Air Force, uh, you've flown a variety of planes and aircraft. And so did you have a favorite plane that you flew? I, um, you know, every plane I flew at the time, and I had a, a diverse career flying in the military. To walk you through it, my first assignment was a B-52 pilot. Mm. Then I taught guys to fly in the Air Force. Our primary jet trainer at the time was a T-37, uh, since, uh, uh, since moved to an air museum near you and nowhere else. Oh. And then I uh, left the active component Air Force, like we mentioned, and joined the Air National Guard and flew F-16. So that's the unusual part of my career. Normally, once you track out into a yeah. heavy bomber, you don't end up moving back into a, a small fighter again. But uh, I did both of those. And each one had its own advantages. You know, when I was on the bomber, it was really a, uh, a sensation of power. You know, when we were flying uh, live bombing missions over ranges uh, up in the Dakotas, dropping bombs through cloud decks, <laughs> and they'd hit the ground and blow up, and it looked like lightning underneath you. Mm-hmm. You know, it light up the whole... All the, all the clouds, um, you know, and I am four. <laughs> so uh, flying a low level in a B-52 was an experience like no other. You'd sneak up on these herd of bison, yeah, and you'd, you'd be so low and so fast that all of a sudden, bam, 
you're on top of them and they're running into each other and falling down and it, it, it's uh it was something to see yeah uh, but then uh moving to the f-16 the fighter plane that's the one that everyone expects is the most mm-hmm. fun i would describe that to the school groups that came to visit i would say first of all if you like roller coasters it's the best roller coaster in the world and you get to steer it but it also still had some of the things I liked about the B-52. I didn't say this to school groups, but uh, you get to blow stuff up, too, yeah. in that <laughs> plane. So. And uh, to be a pilot for that, those are the most wanted positions, out, the most competitive, to be a fighter pilot? Um, you know, it, it changes. Uh, it, certainly, that's the glamour job, mm-hmm. right? And um, even today, you know how you can tell you're in the company of a fighter pilot? <laughs> they'll tell you yeah right, right. <laughs> um uh that's uh that's certainly got the most uh mystique about it but um you know the nature of war has evolved the last 20 years or so in the in the arab wars and in iraq and afghanistan the guys who have been doing all the frontline work mm-hmm. are uh, predator pilots you know reaper pilots remotely piloted vehicles um uh-huh. Uh, fighters like my F-16 have been drilling circles in the sky, right. doing not much. And it's these uh, these unmanned things that have become the, the true weapon of war. Well, um, right, right. And so uh, now that you're obviously this capable and dangerous, not dangerous pilot, but you have this experience. Lethal. Let's call it lethal. Lethal, yeah. Uh, how did you turn that into the civilian side where you're, you know, helping passengers cross the country? When we planned a military training mission, um, you know, it was take off at this time in formation, rejoin, fly out to the air work area, fight, 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 whatever form that took, dropping bombs, air to air, whatever, mm-hmm. rejoin, come back, land at the field. Um, you know, so we would spend the better part of an hour pre-briefing the fights. And when we got to the, you know, out and backs, we just say standard the way we always do it. It's written down. Everybody do it that way. When I became a commercial airline pilot, all the fight stuff went away. And the standards that we spent five minutes talking about became the only thing that we do. So mm-hmm. um, it's a lesser included mission, if you will, uh, if you can fly a combat aircraft and perform that wartime mission, the to and the from is is included in every one of those, but it's the easiest thing you do all day. Right. And do you miss being in this, you know, cockpit of an F-16? Uh, you know, physiologically, uh, I am beyond the age where I can do that anymore. Right. <laughs> um, and and, and uh, I am still paying the price today for the things I did in, in those planes. And really, all the ejection seat aircraft I flew. Back and neck problems are endemic among right. everybody who does that. The F-16 maxed out at 9 Gs. You figure mm-hmm. your head with your helmet on <laughs> ca- weighs what? 20 pounds something like that so 180 pound head you know and you're trying to turn it around and look and see the guy Uh behind you who's trying to shoot you humans are not made to do that so no i don't miss any of the physical stressors of doing that but i do sometimes have dreams of flying again you know what that felt like to do that and to to steer the roller coaster great um well now that you're in this you know retired state of flying compared to this you know intense cockpit of the f-16 how did you get to be able to fly internationally yeah so the whole commercial airline business in fact the whole yeah from the from the smallest little passenger puddle jumper to the 787 that i fly Mm -hmm. is all seniority based all date of hire based so when you get first hired by your airline you get the worst schedule and you're working on every holiday and every Mm -hmm. weekend to the least desirable destinations and if you hang around long enough then you start doing wide body long haul flying to glamorous destinations in europe and and so all i did is just keep showing up to work just working and working well that's a that's a great plan i guess um and then really making full circle uh given all your flying experiences already you decided was it then that you decided to do um hobby flying or was that before 
Yeah, that's a little bit of a jump, and it'll lead us into our whole next chapter of discussion. But um, I had, you know, in much the same way people who join the military do so because they're close to somebody who's done it. Yeah. I had a close friend who had been flying RCs for years uh, Mm -hmm. and kept telling me, you should do it, you should do it. When my kids were younger, there just wasn't bandwidth. You know, Uh if it was something my kids were interested in doing, yeah, then of course I'd be doing it with them. But, um, you know, your social life, your free time when you're raising kids is going to their activities. And Mm -hmm. the other grown-ups you hang out with are the parents of your kids' teammates and and classmates and all that. Uh, So they're... It was not something my kids were interested in, uh, so I did not have bandwidth for it. And I got to admit to a little bit of snobbery, I think, too. You know, I thought to myself, hey, man, I fly real planes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I don't, I don't need those little toys. Uh, but uh, then I got sick. And, mm-hmm. and that's a story we can go into yeah. before, but, uh, or later, rather. Um, and RC flying, you know, all of a sudden there was, I wasn't working. Yeah. My kids were growing up, becoming autonomous, doing their own thing. So I had a ton of time on my hands all of a sudden. And uh, it turned out to be really therapeutic for me mm-hmm. as well. Um, and, and so that's how I eased into it. And I continue it today now that I'm well and now right. that I'm getting pulled back into the job and, and work and, and uh, struggling to find time to do all the things I want to do. I, I stick with it. Um, because it offers me some of the rewards that I lost when I left the military, for example. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, there was a tremendous sense of camaraderie, uh, as you might imagine, when you're in the military and yeah. when you're in the military flying. We're all on the same team. We're all working together for one thing. In the airline business, it is not unusual to fly with a fellow pilot and then not see that pilot again for six months. You know, you, the way the pairings work yeah. and, and the, the varying schedules and everything. So it very much feels like I am an independent contractor in my airline job and I'll meet someone and spend three days with them and like them a lot and never see them again. So mm-hmm. none of that camaraderie is around. Uh, there's really a social aspect of uh, radio control flying that, that fills a hole in my life that, um, that left when, the, when I finished in the military. And I also think it has a enduring uh, therapeutic value and mm-hmm. and I can pivot into that whole discussion if you'd like to talk about uh, how I got sick and that whole thing yeah I like I love to hear about that so I was 52 years old when I got a blood clot in an artery in my neck for reasons we still don't fully understand today uh, so mm-hmm. this is a stroke and yeah. it, in my case uh, killed a spot on my brain stem The main symptoms for me were uh, my two eyes didn't focus on the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then I had vertigo like, uh, you know, I know this is not you, but some of our listeners may have in their youth uh, been irresponsible users of alcohol. Mm -hmm. And uh, like the worst room spins you can imagine, I had unceasingly for a month. Um, oh, that's terrible. Uh, yeah, it, there was no mystery as to what whether something was wrong with me or not. It was just a question of what it uh-huh. was. Um, so this uh, this stroke manifests, and um, after I get it diagnosed, I'm asking my neurologist, you know, what's the path out of the woods here? Um, yeah. Is it building accommodations into my life to make make it easier to move my way through life with my mm-hmm. bent brain? Or is it uh, doing difficult things that uh, challenge my brain and force it to build new neural pathways around the dead spot compensating for what's lost? Mm -hmm. And his answer was, uh, yeah, do that. Both of those things. (laughs) So um, going back to the symptoms, uh, for me, you know, the two eyes not focusing on the same thing. You can imagine tracking a moving plane, uh, keeping track of its orientation, you know, as it it flips. Um, hugely therapeutic hugely hard for me to do too and Uh and i had a very unusual uh training program introduction into rc Mm -hmm. because my first six to nine months were uh fpv the first person video Uh, we mounted the little camera we had a tv Mm -hmm. screen or sometimes goggles 
uh, because I knew how to fly a plane from the perspective of a person sitting in it. And I could draw upon that library of intuitive things. Um, I could land a plane real well. I had a good feel for the ground. Uh, What I couldn't do is line of sight flying. Mm -hmm. And it took the longest time to build that skill set. But um, as I tried, these are the hard brain things that I was doing to build the new neural pathways, right? Right. And it doesn't matter what you do, only that it's hard. Um, and uh, this pivots now to why am I still doing it, right? Because I got better. Yeah. I, I went back to my job. Why am I still flying RC? Sure, I enjoy the community and the friends I made and the time I spend with them. Mm-hmm. But I think uh, clinically, and and let's uh, let's stipulate I am not a doctor. <laughs> and none of my medical opinions are founded in empirical research at all. So they're worth exactly what you're paying for them right now. <laughs> uh, but, you know, a stroke, on the day you have a stroke, a lot of your brain dies instantly. Mm-hmm. Um, what is aging but a little bit of your brain dying every day over a long time? So I offer... The philosophy that the things you do to recover from a stroke are the same things you do to combat the process of cognitive aging. And by continuing to do things that are hard and challenge yourself. And there are books about this that suggest Mm -hmm. things like uh, brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand. You Um, know, scroll your phone with your other thumb. Yeah. Uh, You know, just do things. Take a different way home from work or school. Uh, Things like this feel like work, and we instinctively avoid that. But by accepting those challenges, uh, you are giving your brain a workout and and keeping your brain younger mm-hmm. than if you just let it age unchecked. And how long of that process did it, or how long was that? Did that process take? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the FAA, once you stroke out, requires yeah. that you be out of the cockpit for a minimum of two years. Because what they really want to know for sure is, um, uh, are you at risk of future strokes, right? Uh, Particularly in in these cases like mine where it's not super clear what caused it. Mm -hmm. Um, So let's get a little time and distance away from the last stroke to raise our confidence it's not going to happen again, particularly with a plane load of passengers in the back. Um, So two years was their rule. And I needed every bit of that. After two and a half years, I was back at work, but I I couldn't have done it in two years. I needed I needed it all, and it's different for every person. I got a relatively light touch uh, in my stroke. I do group therapy, even still today, for some of the anti aging reasons and and the camaraderie reasons that I talked about. Uh, And I still um, work out with my stroke friends. and among them, uh, I, I, I am the luckiest. You know, if you went to the stroke store and said, you got to buy one of these, pick one, uh-huh. I'm the one that everybody wanted. Um, right. And, and it, like I said, took me a full two years. So um, a lot of it was insidious. You know, I would have told you a year into it, I'm fine or I'm not that bad. And then as things kept coming back, I'm like, oh, I didn't have that. Okay, Mm -hmm. well, nice to have it now. So um, being self-aware is difficult when it's your brain that's that's bad, right? So, And, you know, before that, you've been traveling all over the country. Now, I'm not too informed of how a pilot's, you know, um, citizen's pilot's, you know, uh, schedule works. But are you usually in different states? For long periods of time and then traveling. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Only when you're making money. Um, you know, when we did all the detective work on what caused the stroke, what we uh, my stroke, what we came mm-hmm. up with was, um, uh, strokes are in a lot of ways similar to aviation accidents in that there's not one thing that ha- you don't the plane doesn't take off and the engine falls off and the plane crashes. Right. It's not that. What it is is five or six things layered together that when they all align perfectly, you throw a blood clot or the plane crashes, right? And had any one of those factors not existed that day, 
you would have landed and gone, woof, that was close. Uh, but you would have got out of it fine. So in my case, you know, the standard uh, physiological risk factors, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high body mass index, uh, those things are baked in. Those are known risk factors. Uh, mm -hmm. And those are things you can control if you want to have a long and healthful life, uh, whether it be by diet, exercise, or medication. Um, other things were occupational risks. Um, uh, I probably was dehydrated. I flew a four-day trip like oh. right before the stroke kicked off. Yeah. Um, because it's such a production to get out of the cockpit and go to the bathroom now, thanks to 9-11, appreciate that, uh, you probably don't drink as much as you need to, so you're probably mm -hmm. dehydrated. Um, you're sitting all day, every right. day. Um, which is bad. Being stagnant is, mm -hmm. is bad. That allows the blood clots to form. I caught a little virus when I was on a trip, and I had a 24-hour layover, and normally I'd be up and about and doing things and going places, and this time I felt yeah. crappy, and all I did was just lay in the hotel room for 24 hours. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes uh, blood clots associate with viruses, mm -hmm. just even common cold viruses. So that was one of those risk factors. It might have been that, but certainly laying in the hotel bed for 24 hours contributed to that as well. So all of these things stacked up in my case to contribute uh, to the blood clot and and some of them are uh, occupational risks right and sorry if you already told me already when this blood clot happened how did you know or did someone alert you or yeah that's a great question and in fact uh, here i'm gonna throw out a public service announcement um because everybody involved in the rc community well let me just say everybody yeah should know this um, but those of us in the radio control community rub elbows with a group of people that are at greater risk for strokes than the regular community. Mm -hmm. So knowing this is really, really important. There was a while they were trying to rename strokes brain attacks to emphasize the urgency of this. Yeah, uh, That nomenclature never took hold, but the concept is sound. And in fact, as I explain my stroke onset, I'm going to ask the listeners to play along here. Take a breath and hold it while I do this next part. Ready? Okay, go now. So I was certified by the Red Cross in first aid. In my military service, I took all the advanced life-saving courses associated with that. And I have taken a aviation medical exam every year since I was 17 years old. And I'm not one of these people that's afraid of doctors. I am in the habit of seeking medical care when I need it. I uh, knew my body, and I knew something was wrong, and I was inclined to fix it. And yet, all those favorable circumstances, I still didn't recognize this as a stroke. Uh, so this feeling that you feel right now, where your body's like, hey, you got to breathe, right? This is important. you got to do something about that. You know, it's intense. It's urgent. When oxygenated blood stops getting to a spot on your brain, there you go, that's a lot, the most you can do. Um, it, it is a similarly urgent situation. But the thing is, your brain doesn't tell you that clear message in the same way that it tells you to breathe. Uh -huh. The message comes to you in a package of symptoms that can be remembered with the acronym BFAST, starting with the F. That's the face droopiness. This is the classic oh, stroke yeah. that people know about. A stands for arms. If you ask, it's the, uh, it's the paralysis on one side. So if you ask somebody who's suffering a stroke to raise both their arms, only one of them is going to come up. Uh -huh. And uh, it's a sword speech. Many people suffering from strokes get misdiagnosed as drunks by emergency medical uh, mm -hmm. people because it sounds the same way. That's it. Right. In fact, I got to tell you, when I go to parties now and there's somebody there drunk and they're talking like we do when we're drunk, mm -hmm. it makes me a little sick to my stomach because I'm, yeah. I'm going back to, you know, yeah, it means that. something else in my brain yeah. now. Um, the T, the last one in uh, FAST stands for time because you are underwater holding your breath right now or at least a spot on your brain is. And there is a limited window to get you to a hospital, get you properly diagnosed, and get the clot buster needle into your arm. Or there's even some angioplasty stuff they can right. do in the brain now um, where they open up those, those arteries and reestablish blood flow back to your brain before all that stuff's dead. 
And that's the funny thing too, you know, my neurologist, after he diagnosed me and I'm checking out of the hospital and I say, so what, I come back, what, six months, a year, you run another MRI and it's healed? And they say, oh no, Jeff, dead brain is dead brain forever. Mm-hmm. Doesn't get any better. So that's why time matters so much. Right. This is the not screwing around phase. You know, it's call 911. It's get to the hospital. Uh, and before we get too far away from the BFAST acronym, let me add in the, the B part, B-E. I call your attention to that. That's the new part of the acronym. Those were my symptoms, balance and eyesight. Mm. Depending on which part of your brain gets zapped, sometimes it presents just as that. Right. The other thing that's worth mentioning, in my case, my stroke had what's called a stuttering start, where episodes of these symptoms and some face numbness would come and then it would go away. And I thought, geez, what's that? Oh, that was weird. Oh, never mind. Keep going, right? Mm-hmm. I went to the ER three times after experiencing these symptoms. Each time came away with a diagnosis of an ear infection or labyrinthitis or some dizziness or whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't fit the profile. Right? Yeah. I didn't look like a stroker. But hospitals often get this wrong. And after the hammer fell on me and I had mm-hmm. the full, full, without relief, strokes symptoms, mm-hmm. I went to the hospital in my hometown of Burlington, Vermont. This is the Medical Center Hospital of Vermont. I was transported by ambulance with all the stroke symptoms. In fact, if you'd typed them into Google, Google would have told you, you are having a stroke. <laughs> yeah. Right? But the hospital, the first thing they did to me when I got there was they laid me on a gurney for two hours. Man, there's only about four hours from when it starts mm-hmm. to when the clot buster is no longer effective. So the, the goal time is door to needle one hour. So you not only have to know the stroke symptoms, be yeah. fast, you have to recognize them, and then you have to advocate for prompt medical care to get properly diagnosed and treated in this window. So yeah. that sense of urgency when you're holding your breath is how hard you should be paddling to get your stroke treated. And thanks for that. Please everyone keep this in mind. This is the kind of thing where if you think it might be happening, man, pull the trigger. Call 911, mm. and later on you can apologize for it if it wasn't that. But if you miss this, that brain is dead and not coming back. I kind of derailed the whole thing from there. <laughs> <didn't I? laughs> yeah. We were talking about um, me getting sick, uh-huh. joining the hobby, using it as a rehabilitative tool for mm-hmm. myself, and then continuing uh, since then, both for the camaraderie of it and the, uh, the lifetime brain exercise. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll tell you, the hardest thing for me as a full-scale pilot was that orientation flip, right? right. When, the, when the plane turns from one to the other. And um, one of the symptoms of a, of a hurt brain is extended processing time. So, you know, the plane would flip orientation. I, I would recognize that something has happened, but I wouldn't know what to do about it. And then I would stand there and compiling, compiling, you know, the spinning dial on yeah. your computer, waiting for my brain to catch up and hope that it happened before the plane crashed. Uh-huh. Uh, and um, that is why I will also give a shout out to um, the computer simulation programs they have now. Right. Uh, Real Flight by Name is the one that, that I used. I'm mm-hmm. sure there are others. Uh, but uh, there used to be some some really high barriers to entry in the hobby, right? Yeah. Uh, you buy a super expensive plane and then you crash it in the first ten seconds. You yeah. know? Nobody's going to keep doing a hobby like that. But uh, now with uh, with computer simu- high fidelity computer mm-hmm. simulation, you can go to the field and maiden your first plane with confidence that it's going to turn out all right. Yeah. And after you know you picked up this hobby. And then when you went back to airline flying, was was it after more than two years, you said, right? Yeah, it was two and a half years. And so after two and a half years, how did you prove your, you know, your medical clear? Yeah, for yeah. Them? So there's, there's two parts of that. Um, the first is uh, convince us you're not going to have another stroke. Right. And that's more of a clinical discussion. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, identifying the risk factors, lowering the risk factors, mm-hmm. um, you know, all those different layered things we talked about. Um, in some cases, it, it would almost be better, you know, if there was a clear smoking gun uh, to, that caused the stroke. Yeah. Um, for example, they asked me early on in the detective process, 
are we in a car accident recently? Or in the next breath, and this is interesting, did you get a chiropractic adjustment of your neck? So if you were wondering whether or not that was a good habit, know that people looking for stroke causes put it in the same basket as a car accident. Uh-huh. Um, you know, those real violent neck adjustments yeah. can, uh, can damage the arteries in your neck. And, uh, you know, a little micro tear becomes a clot, which shakes mm-hmm. loose, which kills a spot on your brain. Um, so the other thing they asked me, in case anybody was uh, still still wondering whether or not cigarette smoking was healthful for you, uh-huh. that was the first question they asked. Did, do you smoke? And I said, no, mm-hmm. no. Have you ever smoked? Mm-hmm. Even apparently yeah. doing it at some point in your life just jacks your stroke risk up, you know, to unmanageable levels. So, um, I mean, duh this isn't going to be the forum that convinces somebody that maybe they shouldn't smoke because they're just getting the word now. But uh, it's interesting how obvious a risk that was when we were doing my medical detective project. So the first half is convincing the FAA, you know, had I had a car accident, Mm -hmm. then I'd be able to say, well, I'm just not going to have any more car accidents. And then I'll be able to keep flying without worry of future strokes. In my case, I had to control the things I could control. And I talked about what those were. Mm -hmm. The second half of it, though, is proving your cognitive ability. Um, And they have some cognitive screening tools that they put you through with uh, tests like uh, name as many animals as you can in a minute. Uh Um, (laughs) And and that has some layers to it, too, because um, not only is it an objective, it's not like 27 is failing and 28 is passing. It's more like... Uh, as you name these animals, they're watching how your brain works. You know, look, he's mm-hmm. going through all the barnyard animals, and now he's going through all the animals of the ocean. Okay. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, people that still have uh, really persistent brain injuries will say, like, cat every third animal, uh-huh. forgetting that they've already said yeah. it, you know. <laughs> so um, in that way, they try to screen the function of your brain. But most of these neuropsychological tests are gross screening tools looking for brain injuries um, and really what we're trying to test for is advanced motor function right. advanced advanced cognitive function um, executive function you know being able to do multiple things at multiple times uh, interestingly here's a little side shunt when I was in the Air Force we were investing a lot of energy trying to predict who's going to be good at flying a plane and uh, so we took all these demographic surveys of Air Force pilots that we knew were good yeah. and then tried to look for um, correlations. And the things that you think it might be, you know, the good hand-eye coordination, the good sports players, uh, it was not that. The only yeah. thing we could find that would track was uh, participation in the marching band. Right, because uh, what it did not not playing an instrument, yeah, but the marching band because it involved two precise complex jobs at the same time, mm-hmm. which is essentially being a pilot, right? Time sharing your brain, and that's yeah. that's executive function and being able to do switch back and forth two things at once, and those are the kind of things that get damaged when you get a stroke. So, the best way, as it turns out, to prove that you are capable of flying again is to go through the training to learn how to fly your new plane again yeah. and get through it. Um, because some of the listeners might not know this, uh, full-scale airline pilots first land an actual plane with paying passengers in the back. The mm-hmm. simulators are so high fidelity now, so high quality, that we do all the routine training, all the takeoff and landing stuff, and mm-hmm. then we do all the emergencies and you know the plane on yeah. fire and all that stuff. Um, and we cover all that. And the first time I'm sitting in a real plane flying it, there's people in the back. But to get to that point, there's so many proficiency tasks and so much executive function and Uh and, and so much higher brain function necessary to absorb all the material in the short amount of time because that's a big difference I noticed too. When I was in the military and we wanted to train somebody to do something and we knew that 90% 90% of our people would learn how to do it in 10 sessions, let's yeah. say. Then we'd write a syllabus with 12 sessions. Mm-hmm. And that way, everybody's going to learn. And some people are going to be really good at it. 
the yeah. ones who pick it up quick. Um, in uh, you know training for hire, or I'm sorry, training for profit in the uh, in the airline business, if ten is the number that ninety percent of your people need, yeah. they'll write a syllabus for seven training oh. events, and some of your guys won't make it. And uh-huh. then they'll give them the extra training they need to get them up to the level of proficiency. But all a way of saying airline training comes fast and furious because you're on the clock and you're not making money for the company. And if you can get through that, that's a pretty good proof that your brain's working. And, 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 and that's the gist of it. Um, that's the real validation. But the problem is the FAA wants to know you're good to go before they'll let you plug back into training. All right. So you take those clinical tests that don't really paint the full picture. But more than anything else, I knew. I, I, mm-hmm. I, I recognized in myself when I started feeling like my normal self again and, uh, and when I was ready. And um, most pilots uh, know the challenge that's in front of them, and they're not going to lie to the FAA and say I'm good to go, only to get into training and not be able to hack it. Right. And did you keep, do you have statuses of how good of a pilot, like Ray's, did you keep your status? Um, when you say how good of a pilot. Sorry, like um, like the pay scale kind of. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. Remember, uh, call back to it's all um, seniority based. Yeah. So uh, that begins on the day that you're hired mm-hmm. and that's your spot. And you are senior to everyone hired after you and junior to everyone hired in front of you. And yeah, I got sick, and I didn't get a paycheck for two and a half years, Mm -hmm. uh, but that hire date didn't change. You kept your spot. Yeah, I kept my spot. So when I came back, that's when I had the seniority to go fly wide body, and that's Uh when I I decided to change it up, because I was flying domestically when I got sick. And when you also went back into this airline, you obviously lost uh, this, you know, two years of free time that you had for the hobby of Model RC. And so... Do you, did you just only do it on the weekend, or how did you, you know, manage? Uh, yeah, when I was leaving? sick, it was great. You go out on a Monday and you go fly. Um, now yeah. the first um, first year and a half of me being sick, it, it was, was therapy. It, it was wasn't not pleasure. Great. It right. was it was grind your teeth work. Um, and during that time, I was a full time rehab patient because I was working hard to to do this. So. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was kind of a weekend event. It, be, it was my weekend rehab activity piled on top of all my five days a week, uh, more formalized rehab stuff. Um, now that I am well, you know, I, I'm out of town a couple weekends a month. And it's it, like everyone else. I'm trying to find time on the calendar to do all the things I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but uh, it's a good problem to have. <laughs> of the of yeah. the two situations, I would much rather be well and employed and struggling to find time to play with my toys. Yeah. Well, thank you, General Cashman. Uh, your personal story is inspiring, and I you know want to thank you for sharing it with me and uh, to our listeners. And I hope that your insights about stroke uh, recognition and therapy afterwards will help many others. Yeah. If you get one thing out of this, man, recognize a stroke and you'll be a hero. I love to talk to you in part two. All right, let's look forward to it. Thanks for listening to the Burns Podcast. Feel free to leave any comments, questions, or suggestions for future episodes. Until next time.